Greetings and welcome to this week's edition of the Rock County Civics Academy. The Rock County Civics Academy is a production of Common Sense Reestablished. This LLC was founded by Richard Gruber, Paul Murphy, and Dwayne Severson. CSR is a communication company that provides educational programming on topics of a public interest and is not affiliated with any political party and is committed to common sense based principles as espoused in the United States Constitution and Bill of Rights. Our programs are nonpartisan. That is, we are not affiliated with any organized or even unorganized political party or political movement. This series of presentations is made possible through the support of our growing list of benefactors, including Big Radio, JATV, Local Cable Access, Ragnarsoft, ragnarsoft.com, Have Camera Wisconsin, Tom Edwards, <coughs> The Italian House, and Havana Coffee on Milton Avenue. Please keep in mind the views expressed are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily represent the views of our benefactors or the broadcast entities who will be reproducing our content for later public distribution. And now, here is our commentator and host, Rich Kruger. Good evening. Welcome to this special edition of the Rock County Civics Academy. Tonight's topic is something that is uh, uh, growing into uh, a, a, an item of major interest across the community. I've kind of entitled it the Woodman's Sports and Community Center. Um, what's it all about? Why now? How much? And, and, and what should we be planning on going forward? To answer some of those questions, I've got a distinguished group of folks who are here to, uh, to hopefully uh, bring some enlightenment to the table so that we're all on the same basis as, as, as the evening progresses. With the, We know what they know. Uh, we hope. I want to welcome Tim Lindau. Tim is uh, an attorney with the Nowlin Law Firm. He is also representing Rockstep Capital. For those of you that aren't uh, aware, Rockstep Capital is the owner of the Uptown Janesville Mall. And that is the pr preferred site for the uh, Woodman's Sports and Convention Center uh, as it stands today. Uh, next to Tim is Angela Pakes. Angela is the president and CEO of Forward Janesville. Forward Janesville is a, is a regional economic development organization that uh, also functions as the Chamber of Commerce in this area. And she's also a member of the design review team that is working on the development of this project and she'll be offering some insights into uh, the state of the art where we are with that as we speak. Um, Bill McCaution, I welcome Bill. He is the president and owner of the Janesville Jets. The Janesville Jets are a NAHL affiliated hockey organization uh, and they got Pretty darn decent hockey team, as a matter of fact. First place. Yeah, first place. So they're pretty darn decent. So yeah, uh, and and he'll be offering some insights from from the perspective of, of one of the principal users of, of the Woodman's Sports and Convention Center as as uh, the project will go forward. He's currently working out of the existing ice facility, and and I know he's going to have some perspective on on the adequacy of that facility that will be of interest. And to my immediately, immediate right is, is Heather Miller. Heather is a member of the Janesville City Council and she has the, the task of sorting through the information and at some point in time putting uh, a seal of approval on the project. Uh, and she's hopefully going to be in a position tonight to, to offer us uh, some of her insights in terms of what she is looking for as it relates to information and the breadth and scope of this project. So with that, Welcome to the panelists, and I want to start with you, Angela, if I could. Okay. You're on the design steering committee for this project, and if you could briefly kind of give us a capsule view of what this facility looks like as we speak tonight. Sure, that's a great place to start. Thank you, Rich, and thank you for um, asking me to be here tonight. It's really a pleasure to talk to the community about this a project. It is an amazing about. Um, it's about bringing community together through um, partnerships and developments that um, add to our community that we currently don't have. So that includes um, sports facilities for our youth 
in hockey, basketball, volleyball, indoor soccer, lacrosse, pickleball is a growing sport, youth zero to 99. Um, and then we have a convention center space that is also not present in, in Rock County. We don't have anything like this. So what we know from our Convention and Visitors Bureau is that there's calls weekly to look for convention center space in Rock County. And because we don't have something like this, they have to go elsewhere. And those, those numbers are going to places um, like Madison, the Dells, uh, Milwaukee, and of course, south of the border in Rockford. So this is a, a facility that will bring um, youth sports, of course, uh, the Jets and Convention Center um, throughout our community to the, our community. And what that does is offer programming. So Convention Centers, as you know, probably um, are, are mostly used Monday through Friday by different types of entities that want to bring four-day conventions and car shows and um, different types of, of facilities and, and, and as that. we get into the yep. evening, we'll be talking more and more yeah. about the breadth and scope of what's sure. anticipated within flexible. the facility. Yeah, uh, At this space. point in time, from a square footage perspective, it's about 130,000 square Correct. feet of, of yes. space in three 000. primary components. It's a, it has a, a permanent sheet of ice. And it has a second component, which is a sheet of ice that is removable, and there's a turf. Uh, it's a flex space a flex for space. indoor and, sports. And then finally, the third element to it is a convention center. And, and we'll get into some of the detail about that. Great. Uh, we're also going to want to talk about where the, where the cost estimates are at the, this particular moment in time. Tim Lindau, you're representing Rockstep Capital. And Rock, Rockstep Capital is the owner-operator of the Janesville Mall, uptown Janesville, as it were. And the mall is, is in a similar situation to a lot of malls around the country. It's in kind of a transition from uh, the traditional retail shopping center that, uh, that we, we had for many, many years to a, a heavy emphasis on perhaps some alternative uses. Why is this project important to Rockstep Capital and the Janesville Mall? Great question. Uh, Rich, again, thank you for hosting us and, and putting on this uh, great forum. Uh, the reality is when Rockstep purchased property in 2018, uh, they understood that a, an overall reuse of the property was going to be required. We saw the trend of retail at that point in time, and uh, I think probably many in this room uh, had the opportunity to meet Andy Weiner, uh, the principal uh, owner of Rockstep, when he came by in 2018, and he said, the days of 100% retail at malls are over, right? So mm -hmm. our job is to come up with a reuse and redevelopment of this site where it's 60, 40, 50, 50, 70, 30, some mix, right? The reality is COVID kicked it in the teeth, right? Um, what was a, uh, a promising property has become a much more difficult property uh, for them to find national retail tenants. Um, and so this opportunity came along, and as you know, I think, Rich, you were on the council when, when site selection was key, and we met with you numerous occasions to talk about why we think that the Janesville Mall, which is uptown Janesville, which is central on Milton Avenue, which is one of the most important commercial corridors, not only in Janesville, but in Rock County in southern Wisconsin, uh, why we cannot, as a community, let that property fail and the impact that that would have downstream. Um, we've put all of our work and focus into downtown, but we also have other areas that are going to be uh, uh, focus areas and catalytic sites for our community going forward. So obviously from a, from a rock step perspective, there's a lot of complexities to this because we have tenants, uh, we have users of the property that, that we need to, to satisfy their concerns but because of the, the, the good progress that we've had with the city, we are incredibly enthusiastic about the potential of this project coming on site. And with the potential development projects that we have in the future, which we can talk about going we'll forward. Cover those in just a little bit. Yeah, I mean, this is, as, as Andy always put it, this is one plus one equals three. It's, it's a no-brainer because the, the ability to be able to couple these together makes perfect sense. The old urban planner in me always comes out when we have this conversation because I, I see it's ripe for a great um, planned use, planned yep. unit development mm -hmm. sort of master plan approach to doing a lot of different things on a site that's really perfect for a multi-purpose 
multi uh, functional sort of uh, I, I development, mean, the, and, it, and it's exciting. And, and I'm yeah, I mean, the, the idea for I, the idea for a community of our type to be help, to be able to have a complex that incorporates all of these multiple different uses, it's it's cutting edge, it's exciting, and it gives us a competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really exciting. It is an exciting yeah. time. Mm -hmm. Bill McCaution, the Jets are doing really well. And the Jets have historically done really well. They're a very competitive club, and you've been using the, the existing Janesville Ice facility now for <coughs> several years. Fourteen. Yeah. Fourteen is, is, is a little mm -hmm. bit more than several. And frankly, you were part of the catalyst that, uh, that was necessary when the city was finally convinced to do some investment into the infrastructure back in 15 and 16. Uh, and now you're, you're uh, certainly part of the team that's trying to promote this facility. The facility is, is grandfathered in to the standards of the hockey association that you are a part of, uh, that, that league. How long is that grandfathering going to continue, and and what are the deficiencies in the facility that is, as you see it today, Bill? So this is our 14th season. First of all, thank you for having me, and thank all of you for coming, and thank you for watching at home. Um, <clears throat> I'm the chairman of the league, so I have a little bit of say in how long that uh, That's how grandfather <laughs> works. Um, but let me say this. Most of you know me as the owner of the Jets. Some of you know my political history. Maybe you don't know, I was Commerce Secretary for the state of Wisconsin for four years. And I view this as an economic development project. The Jets could easily ask to upgrade the existing arena. We could ask for a single sheet. It'd be cheaper, it'd be easier. It's not right for the community. What's right for the community is the bigger comprehensive development that will lead to more business and more sports activities, more reasons for companies to come here, more reasons for young families to want to be here, uh, to have all those options under one roof. I mean, that in economic development, that would be a home run, right? You'd want that. Businesses, when they cite, they look at schools, they look at tax structure, they look at infrastructure, but they look at amenities. What's available? And when we came here 14 years ago, we viewed ourselves as one of those amenities, something affordable for families to do here in Janesville. We still view ourselves that way. Uh, the existing rink is, is old and, and not great, but it's home, right? We've made it home. And for us, what we, would, we could take the franchise to the next level. I think we're already one of the best in the NAHL. But if we had uh, a larger facility where we could bring more people in with more amenities, I mean, why do people go to Mallard's games? Or why do you go to uh, Sky, Sky Park? Park. I, I had to think about that for a second. <laughs> you, you go for the sport, kind of, but you go for fun, right? You can't, there's not a lot of amenities in the Janesville Ice Arena. So it's, you, you have to sort of be a hockey fan to be there, although we've converted a lot of people who weren't hockey fans ahead of, before that. Um, so we could make it more fun so you could do something here in Janesville on a Friday and Saturday night and didn't have to go to Madison or Milwaukee or Rockford or Chicago. So we view this as an economic development project to benefit not only Janesville but all of Rock County. We think it will be a magnet, a sports tourism magnet, uh, and an economic development tool for the city moving forward. Okay. Heather Miller, you sit in the city council. You're one of seven that's going to have to make a choice at some point in time of whether or not to move forward with this project. I find it ironic that the council has never formally said this is a project that we want to pursue and this is the budget that we want to pursue it within and this is the timeline with which we want to see it be accomplished and we've been moving along in this project now for several years um, where is the council from your perspective on the issue as we as we sit here tonight I think the council again thank you for having us um, I think the council right now is in a bit of a dilemma. <clears throat> I think there is a lot of information that is not always fully shared with the project. There's a lot of questions. We get hate mail, we get phone calls from people who are frustrated in the community that are not getting answers to a lot of these questions that quite honestly, we as council members can't answer because we just don't know. And we can refer people up the chain all day long. 
and it just makes us look weak and uninformed. And so we're kind of at a standstill. And until the council actually becomes more involved, I think this is where it stands. It's, it's interesting that the council has made the appropriation of, of up to $2 million in, in federal pandemic relief money to support the design development for the facility. And, and that's been a commitment that has been made and is being followed through on. Um, I anticipate that this conversation will continue at a council meeting on the 28th and, and hopefully one of the benefits of having our conversation tonight is we'll have some additional information that the council can take into account as, as they have that conversation going forward. Because uh, it's, it's not an easy, it's not an easy question. Uh, and it's, many of us view it as an economic development project of, of significance that uh, it needs to have the opportunity to see the light of day and, and be thoroughly debated within the public, uh, within the public eye. The price tag, right now is fluctuated and I could run through the history of, of where this thing started and and uh, that would take most of the time that we have available to do that so, so the capsule view of that is I remember a meeting of the City Council in October of 2019 and we sat in front of uh, uh, the community as, as, as a member of the council and we asked a lot of hard questions and the, and the issue on the table that night was what's the preferred site for the for the uh, uh, proposed sports facility. And we didn't have a really a good picture of what it was going to be then, but we had an idea that we, we, the first step in the process was identify a place to put whatever it was going to be. And, and that's when we had that vote, uh, and, and that was decided upon as, as the choice. And back then, Phil, I can remember a conversation that we had at the time. We were talking about how much money can the private sector generate to support a partnership, and I asked the question, can you generate $10 million? Uh, and share with me what the answer was at that point in time, and bring me up to date today to where that, that fundraising actually is, because it's an interesting interesting story in and of itself. Yeah, I think the answer that mm -hmm. night was, I don't think we can get that high, because mm -hmm. it, I think the downtown effort, Rich, was $6 million, which was the most ever raised mm -hmm. locally, so that would have been you know, 40% more. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. But now I think what we've committed to is nine. So it's, uh, it's grown. I mean, I wish we would have broken ground in 2019, mm -hmm. uh, pre-COVID. Uh, everything, as everybody in this room knows, was a lot less expensive then, right? Mm -hmm. And there was two-year freeze on just about everything, you know, including our business. We, we decided to operate uh, one season where there were 10 games at home where we couldn't have any fans, zero. We did it for the kids because those kids only have that opportunity one, once in their life. And when they're 20 years old and that opportunity's gone, we, th we felt we owed it to them to do it. And it was, wasn't easy. Mm -hmm. So I think we can do more than mm -hmm. I thought back then on the private side, but it's gonna take a partnership. And I think it's one of the things that make big economic development projects works. It's a public-private partnership. It benefits the community. I'm gonna pick up on something Tim said. I wasn't crazy about the mall initially. I wanted it downtown. I thought that was better. But you guys have done such a phenomenal job growing downtown. I think the mall is the right spot. I think that is the next part of town that needs a catalyst to spur all kinds of development, not just the rink or the complex itself. There'll be hotels around there. There'll be upgrades on buildings. People will want to be there on Milton Avenue. And I think you're gonna see uh, indirect economic development like you haven't seen on Milton Avenue, maybe in some of your lifetimes. So I, I, I do think we have the right spot. I do think it will lead to other improvements at the mall to make it you know, more desirable to go there for other things. Uh, and you know, that, that's my hope is we're gonna to continue to work together as a community and find a way to get to yes. Okay. And, and, and let's, let's build the mountain, let's see how how the pieces come together to build the mountain. The last price tag that I've heard was, was around $50 million for a project. And the city has never formally committed to anything. The former city manager committed to up to $15 million. Um, but the city itself has never made a commitment. So I'm just on the table, I'll put down the 15 million. The 9 million raised through the private sector, uh, that gets me to 24 million and I got a gap of about 26 million to get to the 50 million dollar estimate as of this moment in time. 
What's the plan to, to fill that gap? Or is there a plan at this stage? And, and whoever, jump on in. I take it around me too. Sure, I can. All right. You can fill in if I'm. All right. So, but um, that's a great question. So, um, we, this is a, a really good public private partnership project. And we know the state is going to benefit from, from um, a lot of the revenue, right, on our sales tax. So, we did submit, um, we, we supported uh, lots of letters. I think there were, there's been um, asked to the state. Um, I'm not sure for 15 million. 15 million from yep, the state. Yep, there's yeah. been 15 million. I think that was supported by about 29 mm -hmm. letters of support um, for that yeah. level. And um, we're really excited about that. And, and the governor's office is okay. considering that. So. And we're, we're just, we still have a gap of about 11 million then. Mm -hmm. We're pretty confident that there will be 5 million in the uh, reconciliation bill at the federal level due to Senator Baldwin's efforts. Um, and that should happen before Christmas. Mm -hmm. So we'll have some certainty on that sooner than later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we're still at, we're six now. The, the yeah. other six is up in the air. I, I think so. So I think, I think the question though, the $15 million figure was using information that you had at the time. Mm -hmm. um, that was when we thought that the project would be 30 million. Uh, this is a reset now, Rich, right? I mean, yeah. what, what we were looking at in 2020 or 2021 is drastically different than the world we live in today. Uh, inflation works on both sides. The numbers we were looking at for economic impact uh, in, in 2020 have drastically changed. So, so the entire world of this economic picture is night, different. night and day I different, right? Agree with you. So, so, different. so what, what, as, you know, I can wear my rock step hat and I also wear my community hat, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. And so one thing that I'm trying to, to recalibrate my brain, both as I run a business and as I look at a project of this type is, okay, well, I've got all these ex extra expenses, right? But now I'm gonna to have to increase revenue somehow. And what, what I think is gonna become evident as we're working through uh, some, some consultants and some reports to generate, to, 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 to give some, some meat to the bones here, but ultimately we're gonna see that the price tag is in, increased, but, but so will the economic impact mm -hmm. drastically mm -hmm. increase to what we thought it was going to be. Um, and so we all kind of have to collectively rethink this process a little bit. Um, I know I'm, I'm having a tough time doing it, but every time I got to remember, this isn't 2020 anymore. Yeah. So I get the $15 million figure. It's, it's, it's not an unreal number because that was kind of in everybody's mind, mm -hmm. but, but that number has to reset just like we thought it was, was going to be a $30 million yeah. project. You heard a lot of conversation um, among folks that the impact of a $15 million bond issue at the city was going to be something on the order of $36. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a thousand uh, for, a, for an average household within within the city of Janesville, and that number was when interest rates were in the right. single point single digits, uh, and, and and that whole that whole climate has changed, and and the investment time is is certainly different. Inflation has affected all of these projects, and you say we've reset. Um, the plans have changed. Has we been able to keep the community up to speed, let alone keep the city council up to speed on how the plans have changed and, and how the climate has changed so that there's a little bit of comfort there um, I think within I the community? What, what, what are your thoughts, Andrew? Yeah, you know, I because I sit on the design committee, um, and the design committee has a city council member on it also, um, we receive the information that's public to everybody the week before the, the meeting. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's a Thursday or Friday. It comes out before our design committee meetings. So it's public. Um, the meetings are public, so anybody can attend those. Um, but I, I get the, the, the download from the city website, just like um, you can or, or any city council, anybody here can, um, and, and look that over. And, and so it's, it's, really, it's, it's really been an interesting public um, project because it is right there for everybody to grab. You know, and it's always fascinating to me, and it's one of my complaints from my years as, a, as an elected official, as a public official, when we had meetings and we would invite the public to sit in and be a part of those meetings, uh, typically um, you could count the attendance on three fingers or mm -hmm. less. Uh, and then after the fact, we certainly hear a lot right. from our constituents about uh, 
Um, gee, we didn't know what was going on. Are you feeling some of that in, in your role currently? Uh, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. And, and what are you telling your constituents? It puts us in a, in a situation where we have to we have to understand where they're coming from, first and foremost. You have to understand that people are getting frustrated because things are changing. The numbers have changed substantially. Inflation doesn't help any. You know, they're experiencing inflation in different ways in their own lives outside of the city. And then they come to us saying, well, why didn't you tell us? How dare you vote yay or nay or what have you because if we didn't know, why didn't you tell us? <laughs> and we don't always know. You know, it's, it's, it's been an unwritten rule that if you are not on a committee, you are not always welcome to sit in on meetings. And I've felt that. I have felt that personally in different meetings. So when I walk into a meeting and it's a little awkward, it's felt. It's felt. And so if you're not on a committee, you just don't go. You wait for the update and then you move forward from there. And if I have questions, I would go to the city manager and that resulted in very little information. You need to reach out to Angela. And can I speak to that? Because sure, sure, I, I think that's that's a great, great, great point, uh, Heather. Um, and the reality is they are the public, right? They're there serving the public. They're the ones representing the public. And so they, they absolutely have a right to be aware of, of the facts and circumstances surrounding such an awesome transformational project. Now, there's two things I want to say. Number one is uh, with Interim Chief Moore, he has... Uh, I think running a little bit of a different uh, uh, ship, right? So he's come in, the very first thing he said is, we need to make sure we're proactive with making sure our city councilors are uh, aware of what's going on. Um, but I can tell you, moving backwards, which I don't like to do, but just briefly, this is really complex. There's a ton of information. There's a deluge of information. If you were to ask me why why weren't we informed or why don't you why don't we know certain i don't quite frankly know what what you should know or shouldn't know because there's so much right. information that's coming in at all times and changing and so it's part of this just let's 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 stop let's let's figure out where we're at let's get you guys all the information that you can possibly have so you can make informed educated decisions and and i'm really excited because it, it this is what we're doing now right this is and i say we're i mean I represent Rockstep, right? But but I know that that Chief Moore is dedicated to being proactive uh, in coming up with as many ways possible to, to get you the information that you need to make the decision. So I, I totally get the frustration. I understand it. Um, uh, but part of it is this is it's really tough to consolidate this information and get it in an understandable way. So, but just, I get just it. Just to give you um, kind of an an overview. I have, I have a child who's in the hospitality industry, and so I get a phone call. Who do I need to talk to in the city council that is not on board and willing to sign us up to get this project going? Because it's somebody on the city council that's holding it up. And for whatever reason, this is the information that's being shared with hospitality in town, and it's not okay. It's not okay. One of the one of the issues that always comes up in good project management is having having a a, a champion, a leader, and a, and a face for the project. And mm. and honestly, in in this particular case, I'm not sure that we've had a face for the project. We've not had a a, a go-to person. And and one of the curious things that I, I I would ask, and as a member, former member of the council, I would I would be asking a lot of tough questions. Uh, this is the information I want. What do you think the information is? that the council needs to have in order to make yeah. an informed right. decision. So let, me, let, 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 let's go through that, that, that kind of carefully. Bill, let, let's start with you. What do you think the council should have in their hands so that they can make an informed decision about going forward or, or, or not going forward with the project? All of it, as much as they can. Mm -hmm. So let, let me pick up on one of Tim's points. For everybody in the community, I'm gonna give Chief Moore 
a shout out here. I mean, I think he has changed the process. There's two groups. There's a design committee that meets every other week, and then there's also an executive committee that meets every week. So there's all kinds of meetings about this. We haven't had a city councilor on the executive committee until Chief Moore invited uh, Council President Benson. We learned some things about you guys that we didn't know, which was very, very helpful. So I think the lines of communication, the chief wants those open, and that's the purpose of the 28th is mm -hmm. to make sure everybody's dealing off the same sheet of music. And so there's nobody playing hide the ball. There's no chance we'd ask these guys to vote without the information. Uh, you guys, I mean, it's your community. It's all in all of our interest to make sure everybody's has as much information as possible to make an educated decision. So, what do you uh, envision bringing to the council on the 28th that's going to help them feel that they are now informed? I think they'll get updated drawings, they'll get updated costs, they're going to get an updated economic impact statement, which will hopefully blow their minds. Um, and uh, you'll get economic uh, uh, the the information Dave Godek is preparing with regard to per uh, average house uh, uh, tax uh, revenue, and you'll you'll get some comparison figures which we've asked for from the architect regarding what would it be to to, to do a single sheet of ice these mm -hmm. days, right? You know what what's our comparison costs? So so that's all very helpful information that that I think will be useful. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 one of those chicken and egg sort of questions. Uh, this thing, in my perspective, is is kind of gotten away from it, it's gotten away from the council, and it's gotten into a world of its own, and it's on its own trajectory. And now it's I think it's time to slow it down and bring it back to the council and say, folks, now you need to get involved and, and get hands on, if this is going to go forward in any fashion. What's the council specifically, from your perspective, Heather? What what are you looking for in terms of information? We're looking for, I, I would go out on a limb to say we want some, some, some numbers that are mm -hmm. real. You know, we want the economic impact that's real. Mm -hmm. You know, we are, we're all well aware of the changes, but we're seeing things fluctuate so much. And depending on who you talk to, the information changes. Mm -hmm. And so we were not privy to the information that was given at the meetings. We just, you're not involved, it is not your place until we make it your place. And so we're going, we're transitioning from that into a different, a different method of leadership. Yeah, and I, let me just add, I, there is, I could probably speak for the three of us around this table, but probably the rest, city staff and everything, we are like shouting from the roof about this project. There's no need to keep anything secret. This is an exciting project for our community. And to, to suggest that we should try and keep any of this, it wouldn't make sense for us because we're all really excited about it. But there's a time where we've got to organize all the information and compile and get it all to you guys, which is coming on the 28th. Is this project moving too fast? We're seven years into it. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, but we're seven years into it, but there's still an information gap. Is it, is it moving too fast, or is it time to, to have this meeting on the 28th slow down and put it all on the table? That's a problem for Rockstar. That's a problem for Rockstar. Right. I, I mean, I guess because right. your plans, your business plans, are kind of on hold too. Correct. Unless this is somehow brought to the table and resolved. We, we, were, we were ready uh, to hold this site for this project when the pandemic hit, because uh, that's right when it got approved. Everything went on hold, and then we were this close to listing the property with the broker because we were going to consider selling it. Um, and, and then we got another call. I think we're going to ramp it back up. We we need this to move along in some way, shape, or form uh, coming forward. We're not saying it's got to be done by by January, right? Mm -hmm. But we need some direction. Is the city council going to be committed to this project? Uh, or or not, I, it's it's hard to slow play something like this from our perspective. And right? I will tell you that the Janesville Jets are in a similar sort of circumstance. You're you're very comfortable where you, well you're comfortable where you are, but I would suspect that uh, if 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 this situation were to continue for the long haul, you would be looking at your options, and, and certainly those options are well put them on the table. You, there are buyers out there that would be happy to, to take on the task of, 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 of that franchise that you have. Four days ago, we had five qualified buyers. Two days ago, we approved a new franchise, uh, which won't get announced for a few weeks. 
So that means there's four buyers out there. You can make the announcement here if you want. <laughs> it's not us. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, if the city just rejects it, uh, yeah, then we're going to have to some tough decisions to make. Yeah. So, it, it, it's a crucial time. Yeah, ahead. if I can add to to the to the why, the you know somebody grew up here. Um, and then came back for my career helping businesses grow in our community. Uh, one of the things that I hear businesses tell me all the time is our talent recruitment is really tough because we don't have a lot of family things to do in, in Rock County. And they're competing with grabbing that talent away from Madison, Milwaukee, Rockford. So they're looking for talent recruitment and ways you can do this through family-centric things, right? And this is a great example of a third space that Janesville doesn't have. It's It's got a lot of different flexibilities in the facility that families can use, and and seniors too. There's indoor walking um, paths, so, so year-round, our seniors have a place to go um, during the winter and, and inclement weather, so that's really great. But from a talent and recruiting you know, the best and brightest minds and growing businesses here, it's super important that we think about projects like this that can really help with the recruitment, and that includes mm -hmm. Mercy, mm -hmm. SSM Health, Shine Technologies, and a host of manufacturers, and then the offset of that is all the small businesses here that would benefit from a revenue standpoint of people coming to Janesville, coming to this facility and using it, because they're going to shop there. They're yeah. going to grow those businesses, and that really helps our small business base. A lot of but this rolls back, I think, to that, that simplest common sense sort of approach to doing business and that's defining what it is and putting a price tag on it and then seeing if you can afford it uh, and when we haven't gotten to that stage yet but hopefully we'll get to that stage we're, we're starting to get a sense and feel for what the capital cost might be and I, I think the operative word there is might uh, we haven't seen what the operational costs are going to be although the visitors and convention bureau has said that up to some point on certain what it is, they will be subsidizing the, the expected losses in that operation for the first five years. The last feasibility study said it would make, after five years, $5,000 or $10,000 a year, and, and then we'd run with it from there. And I know that there's sensitivity among city council members and city staff about the impact on the operating budget for the city, because the operating from the budget from the city is is highly constrained by virtue of state law and levy limits and and the question there is going to be if we do this what don't we do mm -hmm. and and that's a legitimate question to have on the table um, it sounds like the, the 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 entire equation is such that the meeting of the 28th is going to be kind of critical and kind of important for the for the future of this project um, if you were the presenter of that information tonight to the council, what would be what would be your pitch to the council to bring them up to speed and, and, and help their comfort level as they start getting these numbers unveiled and and the and that look to the future laid out in front of them. So I, we're, we're all presenting. Yeah, yeah, we, we'll be there. We'll we'll be presenting as well. Um, I, yes, and and so I, you know, this is the perfect example here, right? Uh, when I moved here, the Italian house was was confined to, to those walls, right? Well, made, a, made a, uh, uh, an investment analysis, right? And, and determined that it was worth the expense and the cost to invest, uh, to expand and grow and become more competitive. Uh, I think that's the analysis that the city council will have to make. Uh, at what dollar amount does this investment make sense based upon the return that we're going to get as a community? Um, I personally, who, and, and, and again, I am, I am very conscientious of, of the tax dollars uh, that our, our council members are, are stewards over, uh, but this is, a, this is a good investment. This is a great investment for our community. Should this project go to referendum? It's been discussed, and in fact, I'm aware of a couple of individual groups that have said they want to put together the petition for the initiative to put it on the ballot as a as a uh, referendum item in the April election. Uh, should this go to, go to referendum for consideration, or is it, is it something that should stay at the council level for, for their exclusive decision? Anyone want to take that one on? Because we're going to have a referendum anyway. You are. Because of it being pushed after the April local government elections. 
So four council seats are up. That's a majority. Uh, so there will be a referendum of sorts. We had an election last April. I think of the three that were up, two were pro sports complex. One was either neutral or anti. So, you know, we get a sense of the community that way. It's coming. I want to touch on the operational cost again for just a second, and then we'll get to the questions that came in from the audience. There is a comparable. Can I pick up on one thing? I, I want to mention John. Uh, John Westfall is leading up the Children's Museum. Mm -hmm. Angela talked about this. All these things are cumulative, and, mm -hmm. and together, starting with downtown, hopefully the Woodman Sports Center, the Children's Museum, they're all benefits to the community to help attract new families, to give affordable things for existing families to do sure, here in town. Sure. So thank you for, do, for doing what you're doing. Excellent point. The operational costs associated with this facility are something that's going to be important not only to the taxpayer, uh, but it's going to be important to the user groups that uh, hopefully are going to be the, the patrons that uh, will make this thing work if it's going to happen. I looked at a similar facility, similar to the extent I can make that comparison in, in West Des Moines, Iowa. There's the Mid America Energy yeah. Sportsplex, which is a uh, multi purpose hockey facility with a uh, uh, flexible sports area for turf and, and, and other sports and has a convention element associated with it. It's been up and it's been operational for a period of time. And I saw that I saw the uh, uh, the price list, uh, their menu. If I wanted to go in and, and I wanted to rent ice tent time from them, depending upon the time of year that it was, it was anywhere from two hundred and seventy-five dollars an hour to four hundred dollars an hour. Uh, if I wanted to rent turf time, it was four hundred dollars an hour to six hundred dollars an hour. Have the user groups been brought up to speed on what the potential costs are going to be for the use of the facility? Are, are they in the loop? Because that, that's a crucial element here. <coughs> well, there's a, um, there was a, a study that was done about this, and that's public. It's on the city's website. That it was study's the, quite it was old, though, Angela. Um, 2019, right? Mm -hmm. Three years ago, mm -hmm. right? And then we've so, had a pandemic, and we've had inflation since. Well, I'm just I'm yeah, just yeah, answering your question. Yeah, yeah. So if I could, um, so that study does have, um, and it compares um, ice, turf, basketball courts, volleyball court, all those rental spaces in it. Um, it's quite lengthy, but if you want a good read, it's out there on mm -hmm. the city's website. And um, and our our costs here in Janesville are are are, are pretty low compared to mm -hmm. the facilities that we would be competing against. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're pretty economic yeah. um, um, county. But you mentioned the RecPlex in, in Des Moines, and, mm -hmm. and that was built in 2019. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, like Bill said, too bad we didn't get in the ground then. Mm -hmm. But they just announced on November 2nd that they are building a $600 million investment right next to the RecPlex mm -hmm. because they see the potential, wow, there's a lot of people coming here now. Now we're going to add hotels. Mm -hmm. We're going to add convention center because theirs doesn't include it. A water park, other things for families. So six million, six hundred, excuse me, six hundred million dollars is going into the investment. So the the build it, they will come, yeah, and that, is is really happening. Yeah, in it's West real. That, that's a master plan it's real. proposal Let me, that I follow I quite closely, real. and it's interesting. And yeah, it's also and, bringing. And, I'll just add twelve hundred <laughs> housing units and a thousand jobs. Yes, it's a great yeah. master plan proposal. I will. I will go a little bit out of my wheelhouse. And, and try to answer that question, because I haven't directly been involved in this, but I do know that Christine uh, Rebout and the Fisk organization, along with city staff, have been very, very actively engaging the stakeholder groups, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. whether it be the softball and baseball groups, the right. soccer groups, the basketball groups. Um, and so, I mean, over the last six months, there have been, just in the design process, in terms of what do you need? What is required here? We don't want to build something that you can't utilize. So I know that they have been very actively brought in. Pricing, I know, has been a part of that discussion. To what extent, I don't know. But I don't think if, if you would ask uh, Ryan Roth at Janesville Basketball Association, I think he would feel like he's been pretty pretty engaged in the process. Okay. So that, that, that speaks to two of the questions that are okay. coming in from the audience. The first one was, how does this compare to other youth public-private partnerships such as the Rock Aqua Jays, the Janesville Youth Baseball and Softball, the Janesville Youth Football, and the yeah. Sports Complex? And what are the ongoing costs to the taxpayers after the property 
that okay. the project is up and running. And those are all fair questions. Good questions. Good that questions. I, I would hope we would get answers to. Another question is how much is the city contributing and what will it cost the taxpayers? Well, we don't really know that because the commitment has not been made by the city. Um, you can speculate that based on the $15 million that was talked about by the city manager, former city manager, uh, I can calculate what the dollars per thousand would be for it. Uh, and I know that the impact on a, on a $140,000, $150,000 average house in Janesville is about $38 a year. But those were numbers that were calculated years ago in a different world, literally, with interest rates. So Dave Godek will have those numbers for you. And I'm hoping that that comes forward he at will. that time that it comes in. Yeah. He will. Uh, so that, that addresses another one of those questions. Good question. Um, you know, you talked about the user groups and what it would cost each of the user groups. And I know I've had a couple of conversations with, um, with her about this. And I'm getting different information with Shelly. Oh. Gotcha. Um, Shelly Slaypack. Yep. And there was a consultant that was asked to step in that had done these projects before. I cannot remember his name. Um, he was there at the library for one of the presentations. Mm -hmm. um, he was brought in to talk about the user fees and Second the operating. Husband, venue works? Venue works. Venue oh, venue works. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but I thought it was interesting when we had conversation in regards to the user fees and what have you, I had asked the question about using ice um, from the big arena versus using ice in the secondary um, the secondary space that's removable. What would the difference be? And he said, ice is ice, it shouldn't matter. And Shelley said, oh no, there would definitely be a cost difference for the users. And so we already have a conflict from someone who does that versus the operations department for the city, it's, it's, and it's so I look at that going, yeah. ice we're, ice. we're, not, yeah. we're yeah. not on the same page keep, keep in mind out. on that, and again, I'm speaking a little bit out of, out of my league on this, but the, the city is not going to be running the arena, right? They'll, they'll treat it like the golf courses, where they'll hire an outside group to run it. As the we didn't know that. It. We What's did that? not know that. Oh, well. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's another one of those dark areas, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll run it like, I, I'm, that's... That's been, I know that's been presented at, at meetings in the past that I've been at, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's gonna be a management group that comes and in. And it's and interesting because it. right along with that, that line of questioning, if the city is the owner and the operator of it, that changes some of the property tax dynamics and that changes some of the sales tax dynamics. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, all of that goes into that, that, that into the weeds conversation yeah. that, that will have to be had at some particular point in time. What is really interesting, Heather, from your comments is, is really I'm interested in seeing the new feasibility study when it gets revealed to the public on the 28th, hopefully. And I'm, 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 I'm anxious to see the changes between what was presented uh, in, in 19, or in 2019, 2018, uh, and, and what we're dealing with today because You've all said up front that we're in a different world today than we were then, and frankly, it was a different project then than what it is today. How does the fact that there will be a casino and convention facility going up in Beloit uh, impact any of the thought process for this project going forward? Um, Angela, you want to take that on? Well, I guess it depends on um, on your where your use of the facility. Certainly, there's there's no ice in in a, in a casino. Um, and I think from a health and well-being, I like that this this facility is is definitely a smoke-free facility um, and has a lot of other amenities in it that that. Um, so it would be in competition theoretically, potentially. Um, but but it's it's just like we'd be I'm in probably competition. Probably not with the best else. person to really yeah. assess that. Okay. I think the Convention okay. and Visitors Bureau would be the better better person yeah. to answer that. But yeah. I think yeah. I mean to be honest with you, I think there's enough to go around. I yeah. think I think regionally, if we want to be competitive, uh, uh, Beloit success is our success, and our success is Beloit success. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think if we want to be a regional uh, destination, um, I, I'm I view that personally, my personal opinion, not on behalf of Rockstep, is. 
bring it on. I, I, I love our project. I think our project will stand on its own, and I don't think we need to be concerned about uh, competition. Well, there is a casino just up the road, right? So yeah. we do have a casino just up the road, not even 30 minutes. So so there's there's that already, and um, it, those those places were taken into consideration in the studies. So they do yeah. they did look at the other competing areas of. I think the one thing that everybody is very anxious to see is that new feasibility study. Uh, to see how the environment has changed in the last two years, in the last three years. Yeah. I think it will yeah. be a very telling story and it's, it's worth the, the time to, to dig into the weeds and do the analysis and get the sense and feel for, for what is or isn't possible going forward with that. Um, I, that's one of, the, one of the challenges when a project has, has honestly dragged on as long as this project has uh, in, in, in the ideal world. Damn, it would have been nice to, to, to break ground on something before all of this other stuff came into play. Right. But, but the fact is, I didn't it have hasn't. Gray hair and, when and this now, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, in fact, been. the matter is, it hasn't. And now we're in a position where we have to clean the yeah. clean the slate and, and rethink all of the assumptions going in. Yeah. I think that's something we'd all universally agree is probably an appropriate yeah. consideration at this point in time. Question from the audience. Um, and this one goes on a little bit, and I'll try and try and summarize it. Over the last few years, the Forward Foundation has been the instrumental in raising uh, millions of dollars for the downtown Arise project. Um, is the Forward Foundation active in this project, and will they be working to uh, generate funding for the project? So we're generating the funding and running it through the Forward Foundation, okay. so they've been involved. They're the fiscal agent, or? At this point, okay. yes. So, but the the principle for the fundraising is is the friends of Fisk. the, the yeah. Fisk. Okay. Yeah. And and that organization. But the Forward is, Foundation has been a partner. Yep. Okay. Uh, the next question is, how much are the Jets investing? So that's a big question. It's a huge question because it. Uh, it sort of depends on what the facility looks like, what all the costs will be, uh, but that'll that'll be answered before the city council takes a vote. That I can commit to you. But just so everyone knows, the Jets pay for the ice they use. Uh, we also pay rent, and so you only have half of the Jets organization. I have ten teams in Madison in the springtime and three in the fall that uh, base out of Madison, those all would come here. So you would get the whole Jets operation here. So you'd, we would grow here. Uh, and that hasn't probably been said publicly, but it's yeah. worth noting because those are all fee-paying users too. And that's a, I think that's an important thing to bring to the table. Wow. Uh, that's, that's a piece of information we didn't have previously and that, that helps in that equation. So, so knowing this, is it is it enough to have one full-time sheet and one seasonal? So if we can make, adding that yeah, if we work it out with the city, it's a great question, Heather. We, if we worked it out with the city, our junior Jets teams could have tournaments here all through March and April when it's dead time. That's when they operate, right? I could also bring tournaments here in September and October, which are other dead times, which you can't currently get. Your, your youth organization doesn't start till the end of September, beginning of October. Mine starts in, in August. So one runs from about the 15th of March through the 15th of May, maybe the 1st of June. And then the Jets have their camps. Uh, and then my fall midget program runs about the 1st of August to, until high school starts, the first weekend in November. So there, there are other Jets properties that don't currently play here because there isn't enough ice. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple of questions in here as to what is the payoff. And, and again, it, I think the, the payoff that, that people are asking about, you would answer probably with the previous feasibility study and that we've kind of thrown off the table because yeah. the, the environment's changed and, and the community has changed. So that's a new piece of information that, that hopefully will come forward and the public can, can consume that piece of information. I think it's critical to the decision-making process, is it not? Mm -hmm. uh, Without question. 
probably the single most important. I think that question. that's probably yeah. the single most mm -hmm. important, uh, particularly from a, uh, we, we talk about spin off development, mm -hmm. and, and that's a crucial part of this equation that is very difficult to guesstimate or estimate, but nonetheless, uh, you know, that's going to be a question. It's going to be the, the return on our investment, right? What is the return on your investment? Mm -hmm. What's the yep. ROI? Yep. How do you answer the question from uh, those individuals in the community who will say any amount of money that you spend on this facility is too much money that you're spending on this facility? Uh, they're on fixed incomes and they're getting taxed out of their homes today. So I think that's a tough question. Um, I, there, there is always the need to be sensitive uh, to everybody in the community and people stations in life are, are incredibly different. However, um, as a community, we have to be cognizant of the fact that we are ultimately in competition for people, for jobs, for businesses. And so we have to try to find ways that we can invest in our community that create us uh, or separate us from our competitors, uh, from our peer cities, uh, from the other cities that present uh, growth challenges to us. And so, uh, what is best for the community is finding ways to invest these dollars to be able to grow and expand and improve. Um, and, and sometimes it's, it's going to cost in, in, in terms of dollars to make that investment. Um, but now is the time to do that uh, based upon the project that's before us, based upon the great partners that we have with the Jets and other organizations. So. Um, I get it. I understand it. I, I sympathize with it, but I, I think this is a community investment project that the timing is, is just right. In hindsight, what could have been done to make or allow the public to be better informed about this project? Um, and what will be changed going forward beyond what, what we've already experienced? A new, new bit of candor that we, I find refreshing. What, what in hindsight could have been changed and what should we look forward to going forward as the council deals with this not only on the 28th and makes some decisions, but, but uh, the fallout of those decisions after the 28th? I'd say no COVID. That would I be think really we had a pretty regular cadence going mm -hmm. pre-COVID where we were in front of the council more. Um, you know, and there are folks that don't want to come out still. Some of our fans haven't come back since COVID sort of waned. It's not gone, but it's waned. So uh, I think that really w disrupted the whole process, added two years, maybe two and a half. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think we'd be fine getting back to a regular public cadence with the city council. We have no problem with that. I mean, this, to Tim's point, this is a 50 year investment, maybe longer. The current rink is 50. This one could last longer than that and have more utility. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll, just, I'll just add, you know, I, um, I think, uh, Bill mentioned it earlier, you know, we've, I feel like we've got a, a more open communication and dialogue um, that Chief Moore's really taken on. And, and, and Heather, your comment earlier about asking questions, and I don't know, ask Angela, I'm like, I had no idea that you were being told that. So I'm just hearing that for the first time tonight, and I'm like, well, I wish you would have yeah, called too. me. I'm sorry, um, I didn't know. Um, but, you know, we held um, over a dozen community forums on this, and in September and October, alone our outreach team um, met with over a thousand individuals in just those two months so not including the other 12 mm -hmm. i i i think we're trying to we're trying to be out there it's it's great to be able to be here tonight so thank you again mm -hmm. for this and mm -hmm. heather if you have any questions yeah. please call <laughs> uh, let me know We'd well, like to and, and i will tell you that that from my perspective in hindsight uh, the whole transparency issue would have been would have been something that you can spend a lot more energy on than, and you can never spend enough energy on transparency and, and getting the word out and getting people involved and being part of the solution as opposed to asking the question later, you know, why did it happen and why wasn't I part of that? Um, and, and, and it's forums like this that, yeah. that make a difference in getting that information out to the public. Because um, it, is, it is a thin line to walk to, Rich, oh, because... I I mean, there's information coming from all sorts of different directions, and so how to compile that information and put it in, in a format that's, that's ready and accessible to the city council members. I mean, I think, Heather, you gave an example before about the hospitality industry. Well, you know, that's sometimes what you're trying to avoid, and you can go mm -hmm. too far in trying to avoid 
little snippets getting out and people talking rumors and spreading rumors mm -hmm. and say, did you hear this? Did you hear that? And so it's trying to find that right balance of, okay, now we've got enough information to, to give to you. And so I think, I think going forward, I know Chief Moore is just absolutely dedicated to being proactive and getting you the information. And that I, I think that that's in yeah. incredibly important. I can remember a conversation uh, back in the training room on the evening of the 19th of October with one of the one of the project proponents and suggesting to her at that point in time that there really needed to be a public face for this project mm -hmm. if this project was going to go forward in a fashion that uh, there would be a central point of contact and all the information would come from that central point of contact as opposed to having information coming from a zillion and one different sources, most of the information contradicting the other information that comes out. And, and the only thing that results from that is people are confused. It goes back to the three commandments of good government, which are transparency and then transparency. And if that doesn't work, then more transparency. Uh, and, and that would be my wish had things come down the way they were. Now we get a clean slate. Yeah. And because of that clean slate, it's an incredible opportunity for this project to be discussed with the public so that they're part of that solution as opposed to sitting back and second guessing later. We've got about two minutes, maybe three minutes left, but I'll give everybody an opportunity for a last word before I put a close on this thing. Uh, Tim, you've got a, got a final word you want to offer our, sure. our listeners? Sure. I am, I am absolutely, as a, as a Janesville resident, uh, someone who has uh, my, my business here, I am just completely excited uh, and enthusiastic about this project. I get uh, frustrations on, on all, all ends, right? But the question still remains, is this the right project for our community at this time? And I think without question it is the right project for our community and i i'm i'm grateful uh to heather again for for the for the commitment that she's made and and you've got tough decisions uh to make heather um and we're going to be there presenting to you in a, in a couple of weeks so be easy on us uh i ask you he wasn't uh, yeah that's right <laughs> but but i just i i just want people to ask and put stuff behind them and say, is this the right project for the right time? And I think it's difficult to come to a conclusion that it isn't, so. Angela? I'll look, just say, in, 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 in a minute or less. I'll, I'll add to Tim, I think that this is absolutely a, a great investment in our community that will pay dividends mm -hmm. forward for years to come for many families. And, and I'm really excited about the opportunity uh, because it, it will help us get talent here, retain talent, help our businesses grow, especially our small businesses here. And um, I think there's a lot to be said about that that we can't measure. But we, we, we know that our community has been asking for, for more to do that doesn't take away from Janesville, that adds to Janesville. So it's a, it's a terrific investment, and the time is now. Bill? Cool. I think the project will be transformational for the community and for generations of kids to come. And it, you know, this is our home. We want it to be our long-term home, um, and we think this is a big piece of that. Yep. I would like to make sure that we're all on the same page mm -hmm. going forward. You know, it's refreshing to hear that we all have that same goal. Um, I've raised my kids here as well, and you hear a lot that there's nothing to do for teenagers. Teenage, teenagers need something to do, and this would fit perfectly in that mold. But we also have to be sensitive to those folks who are on that fixed income. How do we justify a $20 million expense when you are living in a one bedroom home trying to make ends meet? You know, we have to be sensitive to that. And I can't express enough that people really need to come out. They need to have a say. You know, you can make all the phone calls to us, but we're seven people. They have to let you guys know. They have to come out and say, listen, here's my concerns. Because we're, we're seven people, you know. And at the end of the day, it's going to be changing this community if this goes forward. And if it doesn't go forward, it could be catastrophic in many different ways, but we can't judge that at this point. 
We can't make that decision going going from the point we're at right now. One I don't the, think it's fair. One of the benefits of, of being the moderator is I always get the last word. <laughs> you always get the last word. Anyway, I always right? get the last word irrespective. I, I, the last word really is this. Um, I go back to questions that, frankly, I sat from the Diaz and asked in 2019. And it's those very same questions that today need to be answered so that the public can make an informed choice about this project. What are we building? How much is it going to cost? How are we going to pay for it? And how are we going to maintain it going forward? And if you have that basic information in hand, uh, it's amazing how much simpler it is to make that hard choice that, that the council is going to have to make. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the other little tidbit that in that last word concept that I'll throw out is, by golly, this is one of those projects in hindsight, I really wish that there had been a single entity, a single spokesperson, a face on this project, because we have been the beneficiaries of a lot of misinformation, and, and, and frankly, the misinformation has created lots of confusion. I'm going away from this, this particular gathering of, of us tonight without a I, I'm not committed to it one way or the other. I'm, I'm still asking those same basic questions. Um, I, I, I like a concept, um, but I need to have those questions answered before I can honestly say I can support this or I won't support this. Um, so from my perspective, yeah, we've had an intervening pandemic in a couple of years and a lot of inflation, but it goes back to those five basic questions, and I'm hopeful that we'll get those answers on the 28th when you have an opportunity to present to the City Council. And the 28th is an opportunity for the public to let the City Council know the questions they have about this project and, and hopefully get the answers that they are due. Um, because we're at a crossroads with, with this particular venture, and the time is now to, to let folks uh, stand up and be counted one way or the other. I want to thank my guest, Tim Lindau, representing uh, Rockstep Capital uh, from the Nowlin Law Firm. Thank you very much, Tim, thank for you. being here. Angela Pakes from Forward Janesville. <laughs> Bill McCoshin, always a pleasure. Uh, always a here. pleasure, and I'm glad that you made it. And I Go Pack Go. We'll go Pack Go. <laughs> we'll get you out of here in time for kickoff. And Heather Miller, <laughs> you have a tough spot. I, 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 I understand from whence you come. And, and I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, you can get the information you need to make the choice that you're going to be asked to make. So, with that, I remind folks that uh, the opinions tonight are those of the, uh, the panelists and myself. They don't necessarily reflect the opinions of any of our benefactors or sponsors. I would ask you that you please be respectful if you've done any recording of any portion of this meeting. Uh, please don't reuse that in another setting without the express written permission from uh, uh, Common Sense Reestablished LLC. Uh, we want to make sure that those that information is used in a in a in a context that is respectful and and does capture the full picture of the conversation we've had tonight. I got to say thank you again to the panelists and thank you folks for showing tonight. Uh, I hope that we were able to get most of the questions, if not all of the questions you generated. That was the reason for the gathering. I want to invite you back. We've got another one of those community issue discussions coming up in early December. Uh, we're going to have some surprises at that meeting, and, and, and hopefully uh, you'll see some, some advanced publicity about what is coming in December. And I can give you an advanced picture of what's happening in January, but nah, I'll save that till later. <laughs> for, uh, for our team, for, for Dwayne and Paul and myself and Dan, uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you at our next gathering in December. Thanks again. Thank you.